Good morning, Winwood. How's everybody doing this morning? Man, sure is good to see you all this morning on this uh, little chilly morning, <laughs> isn't it? Um, so this morning as we get going, um, I've got two announcements I want to bring to your attention. Uh, the first one is, if you're a guest with us this morning, or if you have a prayer request, there's a tall card like this in the pew in front of you. Would you be willing to fill that out? We'd love to, uh, to pray for you and help you walk with the Lord and get to know you. Um, and, uh, and so this morning, the second announcement is that next week uh, at 9 a.m., we'll begin our combined service. So 9 a.m. next week will be Bible study. So from 9 to 10, and then from 10 15, we'll have our combined service where we'll all come together and worship as one. So uh, put that on your calendar, the time change, as we will be combining our services uh, next week. Um, and as we get going uh, in our service this morning, uh, I want us to open up uh, at a time of confession to the Lord and just ask Him to, to forgive us and, and to get a clean slate as we get going this morning. Uh, so our personal prayer time, would you ask for forgiveness for anything that might be holding you back this morning? And then I'll pray for us all. morning father we come before you this morning to thank you for your amazing grace thank you for the fact that you are faithful to forgive us lord if we confess our sins to you you are faithful to forgive us you want uh, there to be an open channel between us and lord thank you for that forgiveness and lord we pray this morning that you would be with us that as we worship you and sing songs to you and as we are taught by your word how to be better children Father, would you bless the service? Would your spirit be with us in power as we seek you throughout this morning? Jesus, we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, well, let's uh, shake one another's hands and welcome one another, shall we? Good morning. Let's get started with some songs. Um, we're going to start with He Keeps Me Singing, and what a beautiful day that we have. Um, we, had, uh, we have Carol back. I love having Carol at the piano. And our peppy song for our prelude, um, which was? This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. So we are going to keep singing because his song is in our hearts. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life. 
lives ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife, discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken string, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on the riches of his grace, resting neath his sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. And he is so rich and full of blessings for each of us. And I think he has a double portion of blessing on mothers. So today, just receive that blessing and let's just sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither thy, thy help I come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And the greatest thing about his grace is that it's fresh and new each morning. And his, he is so faithful. We're going to sing, Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. And that is something every time I hit the bed at night, I think, okay, I, got, I, I have fresh Fresh faithfulness in the morning, fresh grace, fresh strength, everything that I need fresh in the morning. And I can hop out of bed in the morning and start a new day, start over with a clean slate, and great is his faithfulness.
seated. So this morning as we start to think about the sermon to come and prepare our hearts for the message, I want us to read Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting at verse 4. And God's word this morning reads, Listen, Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up and bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates may the Lord speak to us through these words this morning all right our next song is let others see Jesus in you and I think that this this follows right in line with what the scripture that Cody just read. Um, I think as a mother, we influence our kids just by our actions, more so than by our words, because we all know they don't really listen to us. So um, as, as if they can see it in us, you know, we teach them by our actions. My mom used to say, do what I say, not what I do. But, we, but she did what she needed to do to teach us and be faithful to Christ. So let's, let's stand one more time and sing, Let Others See Jesus in You. Keep telling. 
today. Uh, over the past six, six weeks or so, uh, Cody and I would both ask that we bring in snacks and different treats that we would distribute uh, to the local public schools uh, during different uh, events that they were having. And I wanted to kind of follow up and just share how we were able to distribute those over the past few weeks as well. Uh, we provided a week, a week worth of snacks for two classrooms at Winwood Elementary so that every day as those classrooms took their standardized testing, each kid got an extra snack that day or an extra treat that day to help them do their best. Uh, we provided a round of snacks for the teacher's lounge at Winwood uh, Elementary School. Just kind of a, hey, we appreciate you. Just dropped them off on a, a random Wednesday morning. Uh, during Teacher Appreciation Week, uh, we provided uh, snacks for Jessica Dar School in the Kansas City School District for their teacher's lounge. Uh, we provided a round of snacks for the Winnetonka uh, High School teacher's lounge as well. Just again, just an appreciation for what they're doing. And on Wednesday, uh, we provided lunch for the uh, Winwood Elementary staff as well. And that is all possible because we choose to prioritize generosity as a church. Then I am so thankful to you all uh, for being so generous with what God has given you and it's just, it always, it, it doesn't surprise me anymore, but it always amazes me that, that we can stand up on a Sunday morning and say, hey, we, we need some, some snacks, and by Wednesday, we've got all we need. Uh, so thank you for that, and I, I believe because we've uh, cho chosen to take those opportunities, God's going to continue to give us chances like that to make a difference in the world around us. So with that in mind, let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you uh, that we could come together and, and spend time with one another and, uh, and, and focus on you a bit as we begin a new week. God, as we continue to uh, sing songs that draw our attention to you, help us to, to connect with you on a personal basis, that we will leave uh, knowing that we were able to just spend time with you this morning. God, as we open up our word, your word this morning, God, help us to, uh, to all walk away with a challenge or a verse or a thought that we could put into our, our thinking and, and put into practice as we look at how we uh, function in, in, our, in our families and, and the way that you can use us to make a spiritual impact on the, the people that we already love the most. Thank you for our time together this morning, and uh, just continue to, uh, to help us to be with you and learn from you today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to sing a song this morning that's entitled, You Say, and it talks about who we are in Christ and how our worth and our identity is based on, on Christ and not us and not our abilities. I don't know of a single mother that has ever not felt that they failed, that they weren't, they, they weren't 
good enough, they weren't doing what they needed to, that there's not things that they didn't regret, that they look back and go, oh, I could have done that better, or I should have done this. Today we're going to forget about all the woulda, shoulda, couldas, and we're going to know that our identity is in Christ, and we believe that. But the challenge is there are so many mothers out there that are just starting their journey. I wish I knew then what I know now. But the thing is, we can share that knowledge with them. We can tell them they're doing a good job, and we can love on them, and we can encourage them, and they will raise up a whole generation of strong young people. So we need to be aware. I know most of us don't have little kids running around our house now anymore. We might have grandkids or great-grandkids running around, but, and we can witness to them. But we need to be encouraging to the mom that we see at, the, at McDonald's that's sitting there struggling that you can just tell that she's about at her wit's end. We can be that encouragement, and we can say a kind word, and we can give them a smile for them to keep going just one more day. So, you say. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not. single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am. Because I need to know You say I am loved When I can't feel a thing And you say I am strong When I think I am weak And you say I am held When I am falling short And when I don't belong I believe. 
right. Thank you so much, Miss Becky. Well, good morning. How are y'all? It is good to see you. If you brought your Bibles, you can turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's the passage that uh, Pastor Cody read for us just a bit ago. And it's the first uh, verse that we will look at as we begin to work through uh, the reasons why we need strong families in our churches, in our communities, why we need strong families in our country. And we'll look at four principles today as to why we as believers and why we as a church need to help families be as biblically strong as we can help them to become. Now, as a society, we still love a good family or the image of a good family. We saw this uh, this past week, uh, not so much in our country, but in England, when Prince Harry and Meghan Markle welcomed their son into the world. And I tell you, there were pictures and, and news outlets. And Wednesday morning, as I was thinking on the family, I, I read a few articles and, and saw their picture of when they introduced their baby boy into the world. And I mean, accolades came from every corner and government officials were sending all sorts of, of kind words and gifts to this new baby boy. And, and sometimes we, we as people, we look at a picture of them on the news and think that's what the family's supposed to look like. And our hearts gravitate towards that. And maybe even our hearts compare what we see from them to what it looks like in our home. And I think sometimes we still fall in the trap of trying to make a perfect family and trying to de develop this thing that looks like it came out of, of, a, out of a Hallmark card or off some movie that's not even real. And, and, and that's what we have in our minds is what the family should look like. But as Christians, we also know, at least in our minds, intellectually, we know that family life is going to be hard. And we know this in part because in Genesis chapter 2, God creates marriage. And it works so well for about a half a page. And then in Genesis chapter 4, one brother physically kills the other. And ever since then, family lives have struggled. In our, in our minds, we just know that it's going to be hard. And we just know that, that raising children or helping to develop grandchildren or even working with our nieces and nephews, it's going to be tough work. It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be fun. And sometimes it's discouraging because we do compare what we have to something that seems so perfect. Even on a vacation, I read a book, uh, and it, it was about the experience that a, a pastor in, in North Carolina had, and he talked about his childhood and about how dad worked hard at the shop. He came home, dinner was at 515, and then they played ball in the yard, and everything seemed so so picturesque. Or we remember shows like Leave It to the Beaver. Leave It to Beaver. There we go. I only saw it rerun. Sorry. We see shows like that, and we want that. But, but we realize we may not get there. And, and the goal, and why we talk about this this morning, is not that we would be discouraged because we don't measure up to some picture, but we would be motivated as to what our families can be and what can be accomplished through what our family is. And you know what? Families come in all shapes and sizes. Step families. Multiracial families. Families to where the parents uh, have four and five children. Families to where the parents have chosen not to have children. Parents to where dad works hard outside the home and, and, and they've chosen to keep mom there. And now more and more we see families to where maybe mom's got a, a thriving career and dad stays at home and, and runs the thing we see families that look like they've got it all put together and they show up to church in, in matching outfits and their cars clean and then we see families that they look like they're like one string full from string pull from completely unraveling right we we see families come in every different way and our goal and why we talk about today is not to try to get us to measure up to some perfect standard but to see ways that we can help our families be biblically strong now, what we talk about today, it is not just for my age range to where we are managing diapers and soccer practice. Every principle that we talk about this morning, it matters for all of us. Because everything we mention in every passage we look at, it challenges all family life. 
And there's something we can each do about all of it. Grandparents, you have an immense amount of spiritual influence over your grandchildren. Because you can say something to a grandchild, and they'll listen. And if a parent said that thing, it wouldn't even make it one ear, in one ear to go out the other. I know that's true because it happened to me. And now I'm on the other side of that because my dad can say something to one of my kids, and they hear it, and I can never hear you have an immense amount of influence over your grandkids that you need to use for their spiritual development. These principles are also true for our nieces and nephews. I love my siblings' kids and, and, and Gwenny, her nieces and nephews, but we got to use those relationships well. They're not just supposed to be fun. They're supposed to matter in building God's kingdom. So this applies to all of us, and again, we're going to look at four ways, four reasons why we need to work to have as strong of families as we can have. The first reason, and this comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, is that the family is a discipleship strategy. That God created the family to help people develop spiritually. And again, this, this comes from the passage that, that Cody read for us just a bit ago. Now, when I look at kind of the, the grand scheme of what I see throughout biblical teaching, I believe God gave us one big end-all commandment. And it goes back to the Great Commission found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And I think that if, if you were to boil down Scripture as to what did Jesus tells us, tell his followers to do, well, the first thing he tells us to do is to make disciples, to help other people grow spiritually. And it's articulated in Matthew that, that you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea. You will baptize them in my name and help them follow my teaching. And that's the, I mean, that is our main goal as a church and as individuals is to help people grow in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So I think there's one thing, and if we were just to pick one thing that we, we should do, it's to help people grow spiritually. And I think God gave us two primary vehicles to accomplish that. I think he gave us the church, and I think he gave us the family life. All right, there's a lot of other great organizations out there. There's Focus on the Family. There's Campus Crusade for Christ. There's Youth on a Mission. I mean, all these things, their goal is, should be to help support the church and the family to, to develop people spiritually. I think these are God's primary ways and methods for making disciples. And we, we obviously know that's part of the church's mission, but we've got to see that as, as part of God's mission for the family life as well. And, and Moses, as he writes this passage in Deuteronomy, he's telling them the most important truth that they need to remember. Again, Moses, I'm, we're going to boil this down for you as plain as it can be. And he talks about the most important truth about who God is and what our reaction to God should be. That we should love Him with all our, all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. And he says, this is, this is what we have to know about God, and this is how he, we have to respond. And, and you are to help the next generation understand this and apply it to their lives. But as he teaches them to do this, he, he doesn't necessarily confine it to go to church together as a family or, or have, have deep family devotions, even though I think all of those things can be important. He more paints a model that as you live your life together, find time to talk about spiritual things. So as you go to soccer practice, Talk to them about their day and, and help them see how they can deal with the situation from a biblical perspective. As you babysit your grandkids for a while, have fun with them. Give them an extra cookie they're not going to get at home. But remind them how much the Lord loves them and the impact that he wants to have in their lives. That as we live our life as families, there is built-in time for us to help develop that next generation, develop their faith and their relationship with the Lord. Hey, one, one challenge that, that as pastors we have to remember is that people are going to spend far more time at home than they will at church. 
And that's why it's so important that we have biblically strong families because they have a much better opportunity. We have a much better opportunity to help our, our children and our grandchildren and our nieces and nephews, those people we love. Home is the best chance we have to really help them grow in their personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And we got to remember that, and we got to make sure that, that that thought stays on our mind and impacts how we use those little pockets of time that we have for them. One reason we have to have biblically strong families is because it's a discipleship strategy. The second reason why is that families are a mission-sending agency. I'm going to read uh, Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. It says, Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord. And he, he would mean daughters are as well, as he writes this. Uh, offspring and a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the sons born in one's youth. Happy is the man who has filled his quiver with them. They will never be put to shame when they speak with their enemies at the city gates. Now, a lot of scripture has kind of a battle theme to it. And that by all means makes sense because since creation, since the fall, there's been a spiritual battle between God and our spiritual enemy. All right, so there's a lot of points in scripture, Old and New Testament, that, that develop and, and maintain this battle theme. And this passage does it as well. Solomon actually wrote this song. And, and as he writes it, he likens children to an arrow. So let's think about what all he could have been saying when he makes that comparison. Here are some ways that I read it. And it just made so such clear sense to me uh, in the way it even impacted how I view this verse, even though I've read this a hundred times. It says, arrows must be carefully shaped and formed, guided with skill and strength, given precise attention, or it won't hit its mark. Sent in the direction of a specific goal, and it fulfills the purpose of the one who fires it. And the most important comparison to our children or our grandchildren or, or anyone else in that generation that we love and we're trying to harbor a relationship with the Lord with, the most important comparison is that they are the most effective in building God's kingdom when they are sent out. And our families have a unique opportunity. Your family has a unique opportunity to help send out that next generation to make a spiritual impact in the world. Now, where should we send them? It's a great question. Should we send them to the other side of the globe on a mission trip? If we have the opportunity to do so, that would be fantastic. Okay, we've done that with my family because I've seen missions change people's lives. But it is every bit as important that we see the opportunity to send them to school with the, the ability and the desire to make a spiritual impact on the kids they go to school with. That we send them to their part-time job recognizing that maybe the customers they meet at the grocery store or the other employees, that they'll have a chance to represent Christ to those people. That one day as they develop in their lives, we send them out into a career with the understanding that, yes, you're going to spend a lot of time here, and this will be how you provide for your life, but God wants to use your career as an opportunity to make a difference in the world around you. Our families need to be sending agencies. Children are like arrows, and so are your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. And even those friends that become like family, they're like arrows. They're great to have around, but they are better to be sent out. That is where they will be the most effective. Now, that is what we have to take on as a challenge, is to develop them and make sure they are ready to be sent out to make a difference in the world around us. Uh, third reason why we need strong families is they are spiritual legacy builders. I'm going to read a passage out of Joshua chapter 24, 
verse 15. It says, and this is Joshua addressing the children of Israel and, and while he is still one of the most influential leaders in their history. And he says, but if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, choose for yourself today which you worship, which will you worship, the gods your fathers worship beyond the Euphrates River or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living? Then he says, as for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. Now this, uh, this verse, it was a very important verse to my parents. So I, I've seen this verse all my life. And uh, for, for a long time, it was displayed in a very prominent place in our home, right, right there in the entry by the front door. So anyone that came in or out, as we went in or out, I saw that verse for years upon years. And uh, I thought on this verse as a new and a young husband. Uh, Gwenny and I had just turned 22 and 21 when we were married, and we had Eli when we had just turned 23. And then I would sit there and I would reflect on a verse like this and, and want to prop up a life and develop a life that says, you know, we're going to serve the Lord. And I always thought that's kind of how Joshua thought of this as well. In my mind, before I really learned what was going on, I guess I always just thought Joshua was trying to forecast what his life was going to be like when he said that he was going to serve the Lord. This isn't a forecast. This is a reflection. And it really, once that dawned on me, once I caught that, it meant so much more. Man, Joshua had seen so much in his lifetime. He had been there and watched Moses lead the children of Israel out of slavery. He had watched the children of Israel be too scared by what they saw in Jericho to be obedient to God and go take the land. He had spent 40 years wandering through the desert waiting for God to give Israel the okay to go into the promised land. He was the leader that took them there and helped them establish that new place as their home. And Joshua, at the end of his leadership, is saying, after everything I've seen, after everything I've been through, after every high and every low, I still find it desirable to serve the Lord. And not only did he find it desirable to serve the Lord, I believe that when he says, as for me and my house or me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord as well, he was an older man when he said this. There would have been children and grandchildren as well. I believe he could say with confidence, they're going to serve the Lord with me. And Joshua left a tremendous legacy upon the, upon the whole entire story that God was developing. But part of that was the impact, I believe, that he made on his own family. And I think that verse teaches that. That after everything, maybe even his family had seen, they still felt it desirable to serve the Lord. And he left a spiritual legacy through his family. And we have the opportunity to do the same thing. You know, we're all going to leave some sort of mark on mankind. All of us, some sort. It may seem insignificant, it may seem highly significant. And our families, they're going to leave some mark, some trait, some characteristic on the world around us. But I believe God's plan for the family is that we would leave a spiritual mark on the world around us. That if they were to draw the loss in family line, that there would be people upon people that could say, you know what, they impacted my life spiritually. And not just me, not just Gwen, but our kids and the kids that they'll go on to have one day. That our families can leave a spiritual influence on the world around us. And we have that opportunity. Now, it will not happen by accident. It will not happen overnight or any time quickly. But through diligence and through developing the, those around us, our family that we love, we can do this. You know, there's a lot of things I would love for people to be able to say about my, my crew. But I hope one day I can speak like Joshua 
And I hope that you can too. That we can live our family life now. And whether your role is as a grandparent or an uncle, however that works for you. That we'll do it in a way now that one day we can look back and, and see the lives that are impacted through us and by those family members that we help spiritually influence as well. Strong families are necessary because they leave a spiritual legacy. A uh, fourth reason why we need strong families is it's an illustration of God's love. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25. It says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also the wives are to submit to your husbands in everything. This is where it gets really important, men, so don't get too excited. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her sake. All right? Now, this passage, it speaks primarily to our marriages. Okay? It's also true that Pastor Cody got to pick which scripture passage he would read today, and he was too scared to read this one. I can preach on it because I knew Gwen had to work today, all right? But a biblically strong marriage illustrates God's love for us to the world around us. And that's an awfully important and an awfully honorable illustration that we have the opportunity to cast. That through the marriages in our church and at our homes, we have the chance to show the world how much God loves them. Now, this passage, as I've done premarital counseling, especially for, for Christian couples, this is an important passage to them often. And, and here's, here's how I articulate it, because a lot of them want to know how this is going to work. And I will look at that young man, and I'll say, if you just love her like Christ loves the church, She'll follow your lead. I believe that to be very true of just the majority of, of couples. That if a woman feels that kind of love, they'll follow his lead. Just like when we recognize how much God really loves us, and that really sinks into our hearts, we're willing to follow his lead and his teaching as well. One reason why we have to work and support and help marriages as a church is because they show a lost world what it's like to be loved. And they show them a love that they want in their own lives. The marriage is designed by God to reflect His love to the world around us. And that's one more reason why we work to have biblically strong families. They're so important. And, and there's a lot of good things that they bring into our lives, and I won't discount any of that. Families are just a lot of fun when they're working well. It's a lot of fun to have relationships with your children. A healthy marriage is very fulfilling. But we can't lose sight of what God wants to do through our families. And as churches, we can't lose sight of why we have to work to help the family units be strong, because they are a discipleship strategy. It is one of the primary methods God has for developing believers because our families can send out kingdom builders in a way that, that is more effective than any other group that we could, we could design or dream up. Because it helps us leave a spiritual imprint on the world around us and because a, a strong family represents God's love to the world around us. Three quick ways as we finish up that we can all impact families. One, we can pray. We can pray for our families. Now this week, I'm going to ask you all to do two things. I want you to pray for your family. And I want you to pick another family and pray for them as well. And just do that every day this week. We need to be praying for the families around us. And, and one thing I, I believe why this is so important is because the family is so 
important to God and in his vision and how he'll build his kingdom, our families have a target on them by our enemy. We need to be praying for them. Need to be praying for our family. So you do that for me this week. You pray for your family. You pray for another one. You encourage. You encourage within your family. But find someone else you can encourage. Becky said it well that, that you can encourage a young young mom struggling through Walmart. Or you can drop a card in the mail, maybe to someone within your family, and just say, hey, you're doing a great job. Or, or I know y'all are facing this challenge right now, but stick to it. I'm on your side, and I'm praying for you. We need to encourage the families in our church and in our lives. And, and third, we participate. We participate in building strong families. Now, like I said when I opened up, this hits all of us. This wasn't a sermon designed to talk to young couples raising babies. This hits all of us. We all have something we can do within our family unit to help make them biblically stronger. That means all of us have to walk away today and figure out, what do I do to help, God, to help fulfill God's vision for my family? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this morning and for our time together. God, I thank you for, I thank you for, for families in our family specifically, but the families we know about, the families we meet. God, I thank you that you put them together. Um, but help us not forget that amongst all the great things that families can bring into our lives, that more importantly, you got a plan for them, and you know how you want to use them. So help us to see that and to know what individual role we have in participating in building families according to how you would design them. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would y'all please stand? so much. Hey, uh, going to follow up on something Pastor Cody said. Next week, uh, we do uh, begin our, our new schedule and our blended worship service. And last week, when I introduced this, I asked you to pray uh, three things over the, the last week and now this week leading up to it. I'm going to refresh our memories on that. I want you to pray for the staff that as we plan out these services and work through what this will look like, that we'll have wisdom from the Lord and know how to work together to create a meaningful worship experience for all of us. Pray that this would be a unifying and a strengthening aspect of our church life, that this would make us more effective in building God's kingdom. And pray for yourself. This is an adjustment for all of us. Uh, but, but pray that God would show you uh, what, how he wants you to think and, and, and believe and participate in this schedule change. So just continue to pray on those things, if you would. And I look forward to... Uh, what we'll experience in the coming weeks. Uh, let me close this up in a word of prayer. God, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, everything that you've taught us so far and everything we've gotten to experience and the way we've gotten to connect with you. Uh, help that to continue as we go on to our Bible studies, that, that there we'd learn another thing that we can put into practice in our lives this coming week. Uh, thank you for our time together, and thank you for what you'll do in our lives over the next few days as well. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much. Have a very happy Mother's Day to all our moms and grandmas out there.